excellent. Um, Dr. Lau, if you're, if you're ready, I've, I've got a short statement to introduce you and then we'll hand it over to you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Lau is a clinician scientist who is dedicated to making basic discoveries and improving clinical care and treatment of patients with neuroophthalmic conditions, issues that affect vision due to nervous system issues. Dr. Lau received her undergraduate degree with high honors from Harvard University in biochemical sciences and her MD, PhD in neuroscience, medical scientist training program, and fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology from the University of California, San Francisco. She serves as the director of the Neuro-Ophthalmology Service and Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellowship, as well as the co-director of the Vision Research Training Program. Please welcome Dr. Joyce Lau. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, everybody. I um, am going to uh, talk about eye brain issues in microgravity and the effect of uh, hypoxia in COVID-19 infection. I'm gonna try to see if I could remote control my talk here. Oh, good. Uh, I have no financial uh, disclosures. Let's start with a case. This is a 57-year-old male astronaut who was spending six months at the International Space Station. Six weeks into mission, he developed blurry vision in both eyes. He discovered that he needed new glasses in order to be able to read and do uh, near activities. Post-flight, he had a comprehensive ophthalmic evaluation and uh, they were uh, noted uh, to have uh, something called cotton wool spots, which are basically areas of ischemia or loss of oxygen, uh, which is uh, depicted by the white arrow there. There are also something called choroidal folds, which are basically wrinkles in the retina, which you can see uh, with the black arrows. The good news was his vision did improve and he no longer needed different reading glasses as a result of the hyperopic shift, meaning a shift of the optical focus uh, of his vision uh, during flight. His con wool spot also improved. I'm trying to advance, but... Uh... So the slide, oh, there you go. Uh, so the cotton wool spot, the, the small area of ischemia or loss of oxygen resolved. Unfortunately, the wrinkle in his retina uh, called choroidal folds persisted. So we'll come back to this case at the end. Uh, he has what's called spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANGS. This is arguably the most important health reason that we're unable to go to Mars or other long duration deployments. The um, prolonged exposure to microgravity is thought to cause a structural and functional change in the eyes and brain. Let me give you a little background on the eye brain network so you have a better idea what happens when the eye brain network is not working in space. Here is a, um, a diagram of a brain uh, with a visual pathway illustrated. And so what you see is that the eye serves as a camera uh, to capture the visual information. In this case, it's a ladybug. Uh, so this image of the ladybug is um, processed and captured in the back of the eye in the retina and uh, specifically in an area that's called a fovea, which gives us the sharpest vision possible, uh, i.e. the 2020 vision. The information is transmitted to the brain for processing through the optic nerve. And then in the brain, we're able to uh, look at and break down the visual information by its components, such as color, depth, the form as well as motion. So the visual pathway basically continuously and rapidly process this information uh, from capturing the image in the eye to processing it in the brain. And the eyes move in order to object of our uh, regard. 
So basically, whatever we really care about, uh, we look right at it. Uh, that way, we can actually capture and process the information. So the iBrain uh, network work like this continuously and rapidly so that we're able to see the world. Uh, what happens when it doesn't work uh, is that we may notice uh, some fairly nonspecific symptoms like the vision appears blurry. Another way we might notice a change in the, the function is that we can no longer do activities like reading or driving that we usually do. There are also fancier words uh, that are listed on the left lower corner of uh, specific defects in the brain that has to do with vision. So for example, alexia is uh, difficulty reading, agnosia is difficulty recognizing objects, uh, prosopagnosia is difficulty recognizing faces, and echinotopsia is difficulty processing motion information, so we can no longer see things moving. So the way to think about the visual system is it goes from the front to the back of the brain, and you really are using the whole brain in order to see. And parts of the eye that's capturing all this information is actually part of the brain. So there are uh, uh, changes on both uh, sides, uh, the eye and the brain uh, in the um, space. Um, I'm trying to advance my slide, and let me see if I can do it. There you go. So using eye movement recording in uh, my lab, we capture a, uh, a way for you to appreciate what it's like to actually see through someone else's eyes. Uh, so it's just using uh, something called infrared oculography. So here is uh, one of my favorite paintings. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, the circles are depicting wherever uh, this person is looking at. So the larger the circle, the um, more time they spend on it. And so you can see people often start from the center and they may circle around to look at the foreground and the background and maybe even the dog in the front. Uh, and so from this pattern of eye movement, we could generate a visual attention map. So this is the only part of this uh, uh, picture that I actually saw. Wherever there is no heat map, I did not actually see it because I didn't look at it. Uh, so uh, reading is another special type of um, visual scanning pattern. For reading English, we look from left to right and then from the top to bottom, and we tend to land on the uh, longer words, and we may skip over articles and prepositions. Uh, when we watch a moving scene, such as this example of watching a movie, every circle here is an eighth grader uh, who's watching this uh, clip of The Incredibles. So you can see that a lot of the circles are either in the middle of the screen or it's following a moving uh, object. And this is really no different than if you're a pilot and you're operating. <laughs> Audio. Uh, so essentially, uh, we're following um, the very quickly. We are also processing information. There you go, okay. Um, I think I got the, there you go, okay. Uh, I got the um, slide of answer working again. So let's talk about, now that you uh, have a better idea of uh, what uh, we need in order for the iBrain network to um, uh, function properly, uh, you could imagine that this is a very uh, rapid and intensive um, uh, process. So uh, what happens in uh, space when there are iBrain issues? Um, Trying to advance the slide here. Okay. We have recently identified that some astronauts experience changes in their vision, which might be related to the cardiovascular system. Our hearts pump blood around our body through blood vessels. Special adaptations in our bodies ensure that fluid is evenly distributed despite the pull of gravity. In space, astronauts no longer experience the downward pull of gravity 
and the fluid in their bodies tends to move towards the upper body and the head. Our cranium is a rigid container. As the fluid moves towards the head, it causes the pressure inside the skull to rise. This is known as increased intracranial pressure. The optic nerve travels from the brain to the eye. The increased pressure from the cranium travels down the nerve and affects the eye. It causes the optic nerve to be squeezed and the optic disc, where the optic nerve meets the eye, to swell. The back of the eyeball flattens as pressure builds behind it and the blood vessels in the back of the eyeball also swell. These changes can affect the astronaut's vision. One change is that the astronauts become far... We have recently... I'm going to move forward. There you go. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the brain component and the eye component separately. So in the brain, uh, what happens in uh, space uh, with prolonged exposure uh, was investigated uh, with uh, different MRI studies. Uh, in this study, they looked at uh, astronauts uh, that had uh, longer more than three months. Uh, they uh, uh, use a three Tesla MRI uh, to look at um, their brain. And um, I'm going to try to advance. Here we go. Uh, and they discovered that in the majority of astronauts, uh, there were uh, some uh, striking brain changes. Here is a um, MRI from uh, another study that show there is a upward flotation of the brain, expansion of the brain volume, as well as distortion of the midline structure, such as the pituitary, which is the hormone center of your brain and the optic chiasm. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So there's an upward shift of the brain and the brain stem increase in the fluid volume around the brain uh, by about 2%. There's also increased volume in the white matter, which are the information highway in the brain. Upward displacement of the optic chiasm and the pituitary, which are midline structures. These changes in the brain are uh, similar to some of the studies that were done where the subjects were uh, asked to be at bed rest for more than 90 days, which is quite a torture. And it's thought to be related to a, a, a shift in the fluid space in the brain as a result of uh, uh, the uh, absence of gravity. Uh, unfortunately, these changes, uh, many of them persist uh, one year later and they're presumed to be permanent. The areas in the brain that are often affected, other than the midline structures, um, such as the pituitary and the optic chiasm, it, uh, the areas that are most affected are the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. And uh, this is um, uh, very important because these are areas that are particularly uh, crucial in uh, higher order cognitive function, like making decisions and making sure that you're doing the right thing at all times, as well as controlling eye movement and the body. So if they're not working uh, in um, uh, long uh, space uh, deployments, uh, this is a, a big issue. Basically, all our goals would be uh, not accomplished as a result of it. So let's look at what happens to the eyes uh, in uh, prolonged space travel. There was a study uh, looking at a larger uh, number of astronauts using questionnaires. And what they find is that uh, in uh, the majority of astronauts post-flight, there's a degradation in distant uh, and near vision. 60% of those uh, with long duration, um, typically defined as uh, greater than three months, and 29% uh, in short duration missions. The slide looks a little funky, but let me, let me try to keep going. 
Okay, so uh, with uh, in particular, near vision was affected, uh, and they complain about this um, uh, same process as the case that I presented, a hyperopic shift, basically a difficulty focusing up close typically. So for example, I'm nearsighted and my um, um, a, a hyperopic shift would be I need to wear reading glasses in order to be able to read up close. Some of these vision changes, unfortunately, uh, just like the brain changes, are permanent. Of, these, um, uh, stud of this particular study, seven astronauts had uh, ophthalmic findings, including optic disc edema, which is the optic nerve, uh, the flattening of the eyeball because of the uh, thickening uh, and swelling of the retina, wrinkles in the eyes, cotton wool spots, which are uh, areas of loss of oxygen, and thickening uh, of the uh, part of the eye that forms the optic nerve. If you look at um, a, a picture of another astronaut, uh, this is his uh, a photograph of the optic nerve in the center uh, before his deployment. Uh, after flight, what you see is that there is um, this blurring of the optic nerve on both sides with, um, uh, the, due to the edema that has occurred uh, in the microgravity situation. And this affected um, both uh, optic nerves as well as the surrounding retina, which you're not seeing here. This is an example of what a normal optic nerve should look like. Uh, there should be nice sharp uh, margins. This is the right optic nerve that I'm showing here and the edges are, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the edges very nicely on both sides. Here's an example of a patient of mine who have swollen optic nerves due to increased brain pressure. And these changes are obviously more profound than what's uh, shown in the uh, cases of the um, uh, saints, uh, the eye brain issue in space. Uh, but it's an example of uh, what it looks like and it's striking um, a lot of the similarities uh, are present. So there's optic disedema, there's uh, choroidal folds, which are wrinkles in the retina, especially near the uh, swollen optic nerve. There are also areas of hemorrhage and what's not uh, shown here was the cotton wool spot. So here's another example of uh, optic nerves before and after um, flight. This is a picture that was taken at the uh, International State Space Station uh, using the instruments on board. And what you could see are uh, mild uh, optic disedema uh, of the right optic nerve. Um, and uh, after uh, the, the astronaut returned to Earth, uh, they took um, another uh, image of the optic nerve and you could still see the swelling uh, at that time. This is a technology called optical coherence tomography and using the spectral domain uh, uh, version of the uh, instrument, you're already able to non-invasively capture the human optic nerve in micron resolution. Uh, and this is um, uh, studied um, uh, for um, astronauts um, both um, after um, return to Earth, uh, and currently the capability exists at the International Space Station to do this uh, measurement also. So uh, here's an example um, of uh, the um, right and left optic nerves uh, before flight and then uh, 90 days or longer after flight. And um, the arrows will hopefully appear soon uh, where you'll see uh, areas that's pointing to edema um, popping up. There you go. I'm going to hit it a bunch of times because there's several arrows. There you go. Uh, so um, here's another uh, graph. Uh, this is the output of this machine, basically, and the red arrows are pointing to the, the thickening of the right optic nerve. 
here is another uh, imaging using the similar kind of machine, uh, in this case using infrared, and you could see the choroidal folds very nicely. Uh, again, these are the wrinkles in the retina as a result of the edema um, and um, distortion. Here's another example of the uh, folds, and you can see that it kind of goes around the optic nerve uh, area. Uh, and if you look at a uh, cross section of this uh, scan, we call it the B scan, you can actually see these individual waves uh, in the retina. So um, we're now able to monitor uh, optic disc edema in space. Uh, here's an example of an astronaut taking a picture of her own um, eyes um, in the um, uh, International Space Station. Uh, here's an example. I'm waiting for it to advance. Of um, ultrasound uh, at the International Space Station. Uh, and optical coherence tomography. We can now uh, do uh, even fancier uh, non-invasive eye imaging uh, on the ISS using a modality called uh, OCT angiography. Uh, as you'll find out uh, in the next part of the talk, uh, blood vessels are particularly important. And here's an example of a patient of mine with regular color photo versus OCT and geography uh, using relatively similar magnification. And you can see that you can see so much more essentially at the capillary level using this um, uh, fancy algorithm. Here's a um, video to just show you how OCT and geography works. Basically we scan through the inside, the back of the eye uh, to recreate these uh, three-dimensional volume scans. And then we could segment different layers of the blood vessel uh, and look at the density and, and every aspect of the uh, vascular health. We could also do this uh, at the optic nerve itself. And here's just a flyby video showing you uh, the, sort of the amazing uh, um, uh, clarity and um, um, resolution that we could now do to image the human optic nerve. And this is done routinely uh, and only takes probably about a few minutes depending on the cooperation of the subject. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. I'm hoping we'll be able to see uh, that type of data coming back from the ISS soon. Uh, none of that has been published yet. Uh, so uh, I wanna try to go through what causes uh, I bring issues in space and, and uh, basically we don't really know yet is the bottom line, but there's some thoughts in terms of could it be, um, you know, what exactly is the effect of microgravity? Uh, is there any uh, evidence of metabolic insult, oxidative stress, uh, hypoxic injury, or is it related to radiation, which we know is an issue in space? So there was a, a mouse study uh, that was done um, several years ago uh, here's an example of what the um, mouse habitat looked like on the International Space Station. Um, and they looked at the effect of um, uh, C57 black six mice uh, in multiple conditions. So microgravity, microgravity plus a centrifuge that is uh, correcting um, the gravity at 1G equivalent versus controls. <laughs> A video that I took at the 2018 ISS um, meeting uh, showing the rotation of the centrifuge, which is composed of six components. Individual uh, uh, component is uh, basically 3D printed, and you're looking into the chamber of uh, one of these um, mouse uh, uh, cages. Uh, and so there's sort of aerodynamic flow, a way to deliver nutrient and water and remove waste. Uh, and animals uh, live uh, relatively uh, contently uh, for the duration of the study and then are flown back to Earth for analysis. So let's take a look at that analysis real quick. Uh, the most dramatic thing they found in the mouse eyes um, are that in the retina, which is uh, a histologic section shown here, you can see in the control uh, mouse, 
that uh, they, they stain with different colors. The blue is uh, showing where the neuron cell bodies are located uh, at the ganglion cell uh, layer, the inner nuclear layer, and the outer nuclear layer. So these are basically the layers in the retina that allow the capturing of the visual information and transmission of that information to the brain. The red is basically blood vessels um, that are uh, present in different layers in the retina. And uh, in the um, mouse that uh, had the uh, microgravity exposure uh, for about a month, what you see is there is uh, cell death of the blood vessels, uh, and uh, that's depicted in green, and it, the yellow is pointing uh, to it. So uh, essentially, when you see this significant uh, increase in cell death of the blood vessels, you know that the blood vessels are part of the um, a key aspect of uh, the eye brain issue uh, in microgravity. Um, they also did some analysis looking at proteins. And so long story short, there are proteins that are uniquely changed in the microgravity situation that are different from the microgravity corrected with the centrifugation. Uh, and here's a hierarchical clustering graph to show that there are a lot of different uh, proteins that are changed uh, significantly. Uh, and they're lo uh, lo uh, important for different pathways. And here's just a, a short list of the most change, either increase or decrease molecules in microgravity. Uh, let's talk about the hypoxia, which is important not just for space travel, as well as for COVID-19 infection, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we did a study looking at mouse eyes in hypoxia. Uh, this is supported by the TRAM grant from Stanford and done by my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Mesentia Laurel. Here is a histologic section. Uh, you can see that after two days uh, of hypoxia, so instead of the usual uh, percentage of 20.9%, uh, these animals are undergoing systemic hypoxia of 10%, which is equivalent to Mount Kilimanjaro type of oxygenation. Uh, there's not a whole lot of cell death, but there are some. Uh, that's shown in panel B and C, but overall the number of uh, neurons uh, in the retina are not changed, and that's shown in D, E, and F. But what's dramatic is that even though the cells look relatively okay, when we look for evidence of metabolic stress, which is shown in H, you see that there is a uh, basically a Christmas tree equivalent of lighting up of the metabolic stress in the optic nerve and the retina, and that clearly something is going on already. Uh, these are markers for apoptosis uh, with a label CHOP, which is a transcription factor. When we look at the um, uh, mouse retina using uh, optical coherence tomography, you recall this is the technology that we're routinely using to study astronauts' eyes. What we see is that after hypoxia, the animal, uh, the, the retina is particularly vulnerable for a, a, a swelling, uh, which is shown on the far right there. And this swelling is present primarily in the layer that makes up the optic nerve. Uh, we also did some investigation and found um, molecular changes uh, and cellular changes such as glial activation and uh, upregulation of a, a water channel called aquaporin. So these are all changes that are likely underlying the edema. Um, we did uh, some Dr. fancy Lowen. analysis, uh, which uh, basically show um, I'm trying to go back a bit. Um, Dr. Lau, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do need to give you a 10 minute warning. Ah, okay. Uh, we can yeah, we should be good. To try and get back on schedule. Don't know if you were still planning to leave room for Q&A. There are a couple of questions up, but, uh, but you've got 10 minutes. Okay, got it. Uh, so uh, cytokine analysis showing there's basically uh, a um, um, immune uh, reaction as a result of hypoxia. So our model is that hypoxia leads to inflammation, uh, um, elevation of different uh, immune molecules called cytokines, which leads to the changes in the blood vessel, the edema, uh, and eventually to cell death. Uh, this is applicable to uh, COVID-19 infection because this is one of the most important aspects of the infection, uh, which is um, uh, raging through the US and the world. Um, I'm gonna go through it a little faster here. Uh, basically, the infection rate is probably even higher than we estimated, but it's already affected more than 2 million people. 
the incubation period is relatively short and uh, patients have uh, symptoms, some of which are very common, uh, some that are more unique, such as loss of sense of smell and taste. Uh, more unique to COVID-19. And uh, what's thought to underline the hypoxia in COVID-19 infection is this uh, uh, what's called cytokine storm, uh, which is similar to the phenomenon that I described earlier in the setting of hypoxia. So in COVID-19, there's already been some studies looking at uh, all the different immune molecules are uh, altered, uh, some very dramatically in infection. So as a setting of the, the difficulty uh, breathing uh, and loss of oxygen, there is this profound reaction by the body. Uh, some of this uh, are being treated by um, uh, oxygen ventilator, uh, ECMO, which delivers oxygen to the blood, uh, as well as uh, treatment to possibly suppress the immune system uh, in order to uh, calm the, uh, the storm down and then uh, save the um, patients. So COVID-19 has already affected our space mission. Here's a picture of um, people carrying the astronaut Jessica Meyer, uh, who landed yesterday, uh, and everybody's wearing a mask, as you can see. Uh, there's also uh, effects on the, you know, people's ability to participate in the launch uh, that's um, uh, coming up uh, in May. So to summarize, There is um, both eye and brain changes uh, in space, uh, in, including in um, clarity of vision and some irreversible uh, changes of the eye and the brain. It could be uh, present in uh, almost half of the astronauts who are uh, deployed for more than 30 days. And there's currently no effective treatment. So in our first case, uh, this astronaut developed SANGS uh, during flight in his first deployment, uh, which improved, but not completely. This is a picture of him before his second deployment, and you could still see some wrinkles uh, in the retina. Unfortunately, during flight, he developed even worsening of this condition, and this is his uh, retina after the second deployment, so um, it really looks wrinkled, uh, and these, these changes are uh, irreversible. So this is really an issue that's going to affect our space travel in the future, um, and I just want to leave you uh, with some videos of what uh, mice look like in space, because some of you have seen and um, astronauts uh, in space, but these are our mouse uh, astronauts. This is on day two. They're um, you know, moving around in their cages uh, and uh, doing actually kind of okay. And then this is what happens on day uh, 11. Uh, and hopefully the video will work. So they basically figure out how to zip through uh, the uh, edges of the uh, cage. Uh, at uh, pretty fast speed. And then there's some other animals that are just kind of floating around uh, and, and possibly not doing as well. So I'm gonna stop there and hopefully we'll have time for some uh, questions. Uh, yes, absolutely, Dr. Lau. We've got uh, two questions from a Santush Kumar. Mm -hmm. And I hope I don't butcher this term, but uh, the first is I have amblyopia. Amblyopia? Um, Are yes, there any advantages? Yeah, so amblyopia is a, a congenital condition. Basically, the brain, the visual system uh, fails to properly develop because it wasn't getting the uh, normal uh, visual information, uh, typically as a, as a child. Uh, so there's uh, the, the bottom line, there's no great way to treat amblyopia right now, uh, but people are working on improving the plasticity of the brain um, after what we call the critical period of development so that we're able to retrain the brain to recognize information. So definitely stay tuned there. Um, I'm looking at the questions, but I only see, oh yeah, I see part of it. Yeah, so um, Santosh Kumar had a follow-up that, that read IFR attitude instrument flying scan pattern. So um, I, I think you're referring to, um, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure if you're referring to the eye movement um, patterns that have been studied in pilots 
uh, as a part of you know mission control. Um, is, is that what you're referring to? Um, Hello. Uh, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, uh, I'll, I'll touch on both questions here regarding the attitude instrument flying. Uh, all uh, pilots that go through instrument flight training uh, have to go through the fundamental skill of attitude instrument flying, which is maintaining level flight using your instruments. And your and the problem is you cannot fix it. You have to constantly be uh, looking at the various instruments and cross-checking them, the different types of scans, like the music scan, the one and a two and a one and two, where you look at your altimeter, then your attitude indicator, your airspeed indicator, back to your attitude indicator, and so forth. So when you're talking about your, you know, your eye tracking, I was wondering how what you were talking about relates to that. And then regarding my amblyopia, that's what actually uh, prevented me from being able to fly in the military. So I was trying to see if there were any other um, any developments on that because I went through a couple of treatments that didn't quite work fully to try to incre increase the um, the neurotransmitter uh, dopamine to try to increase the signal to noise ratio from the eye to the brain because it's more of a brain issue rather than the eye itself. So I want to know if there are any advances in that, in that area. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we uh, did a um, uh, this, uh, collaboration with NASA Ames, uh, who was interested in looking at eye tracking uh, during simulated um, pilot uh, experience, basically. Uh, the, the, the eye tracking would be a perfect way to uh, better analyze that. I'm not sure if people have used that uh, relatively simple technology to uh, look at um, various sort of critical situations, but I, I absolutely I think that's important. So you could actually see basically through the pilot's eyes and know uh, what they're paying attention to and what they're not paying attention to. So it'd be perfect for designing uh, better uh, instrumentation as well as better training. Uh, in terms of the amblyopia, uh, we at Stanford are working on um, uh, brain stimulation as a way uh, uh, to enhance um, plasticity as treatment for amblyopia, um, you know, potentially stimulating the eye uh, by giving uh, a high contrast, a particular way of delivering the visual uh, scene, as well as stimulating the brain, the visual cortex uh, directly. Are you referring to the Gabor patterns? I know the Israelis have done some research on that, and also the use of the drug levodopa carpidopa to boost the, uh, the dopamine is the neurotransmitter which is found to be uh, lacking in amblyopics? Um, there's a lot of research, both at the level of the eye, uh, including uh, neurotransmitters, as well as the brain. Dopamine uh, is present in the retina as well as the brain, and it's uh, really important for uh, gating of visual information as well as processing of visual information. So um, rest assured, people are definitely working on it, uh, but we're just not yet ready to deliver that miracle treatment for amblyopia. But there are millions of people who would love to have that uh, for sure. I mean, even I, I think normal people would love to, you know, people with no amblyopia uh, would love to have even better vision if possible. Uh, so uh, lots and lots of research going on there. And, and I see there's one last uh, question about radiation and artificial uh, gravity. So the problem with artificial gravity is we're currently no, not able to uh, deliver gravity appropriately uh, to larger animals. So uh, of the animals that are even studied, only mice can be uh, spun in this mouse centrifuge uh, that's developed by JAXA. Uh, even uh, rats uh, or larger animals cannot be spun as a way to deliver gravity this way. So it's just, um, uh, you know, biological uh, as well as hardware. Uh, our, our bodies are not conducive for uh, spinning. Uh, so there has to be some other way of, of doing uh, gravity in space. It, it's too bad that it's not as easy as it looks like in the movies. All right, and with that, Dr. Lau, we are out of time. I am so sorry to say, but thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.